Okay, so well. So we might as well uh, get started. I'm Dave Tapes, and um, this is uh, Laura. So we're the fools who decided to organize this thing. So first of all, we wanted to thank everyone who submitted uh, questions, and thank you to our panel for putting up with this harebrained idea. Um, I thought I would just do a super brief introduction, and then we can get going. Um, so in our, our left corner, we have Dr. Dolch, <laughs> who's done uh, some of the work on adaptive radiations in Darwin's Finches, and now uh, post-glacial lakes and freshwater fishes. Uh, Lauren Reesberg, who's done great work on uh, the role of hybridization and plant speciation. Michael Dobley, um, done work on models of reproductive isolation with gene flow and adaptive speciation. Uh, Dr. Jerry Coyne, our um, invited guest today, who's done work on, well, literally written the book on speciation, um, but does a lot of work on Drosophila and fruit flies, which we heard about today. And Dr. Darren Irwin, who's done work on reproductive isolation and speciation in birds. So I thought um, we would begin today and we would start philosophical right off the bat. Um, and one of, the, one of the questions, so this is actually, um, kind of uh, egotistical of me because my comps are next week and this is like half my committee, so this is great. <laughs> um, but we thought uh, it came up during a, a, a few colleagues' comps. Why why are there species? And why do we find those on Earth? So we can start with anyone who wants to go. <laughs> but Dolph asked Gina that in her comps, so. <laughs> I think I should go first. Well, first of all, we're sexual species. And I would define uh, species as um, reproductively isolated units, the same way Jerry did uh, today in his talk. And uh, it's the evolution of those reproductive barriers that uh, creates boundaries in morphology and um, uh, genetics that we recognize today as the stick clusters of our species. So the evolution of reproductive isolation but why is that inevitable? Why is reproductive isolation inevitable? Um, the factors that drive reproductive isolation occur uh, universally, and uh, primarily um, selection favoring different genotypes in uh, different environments, um, but also uh, selection driving fixation of alternative mutations in um, geographically isolated population. In that process is simply <laughs> You're not satisfied. <laughs> I would say one answer to why why there are species is that there are um, there's sort of an infinite number of ways to be a bad form of life and a, a very small number of ways to be sort of a, a very fit one that, that does well. And that there are big gaps in genotypic and phenotypic space between those. So um, you, you get discrete species because of that. That's an no, assertion. That's an assertion. <laughs> that there are well, they, just that there are good ways, maybe bad ways to keep good ways. Well, basically, you're saying that there are adaptive peaks, mm -hmm. and species tend to be clustered around those adaptive peaks. But there's a piece that balance in between them. Big well, I think if you randomly shuffle genes and put them together, you're, you're unlikely to get something that works very well. And that is an assertion, I guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only found that question last uh, when you say why other species are you know, why is there diversity? Yeah, why isn't there just one jack of all trades? And uh, I think. So my general take on this is there's diversity because life generates opportunity for other life. So as soon as you have, I mean, you know, essentially you have to go back to the origin of life if you ask that question. And the way I envisage this is that once you have reproduced units, they create opportunities to, say, other units that either parasitize them or use some waste products or something. So I think life in itself generates a lot of, uh, it's kind of this niche construction. And so it's a positive feedback. And that's, I think, why we ultimately have that But there's a difference between diversity and, and species. I mean, you could have one species that was extremely diverse, 
instead of these discrete clusters that are not overlapping. Yeah, well, I also think, I mean, to me, but that's, you know, perhaps not a you know, question I, I'm not too concerned about the species definition. I'm actually, you know, when I read your book, I'm more concerned with the distribution of, you know, it's a huge phenotype space, like a histogram of all life forms. Why is it not? So I'm not too concerned that the different clumps are geographically isolated or not. And, and in many you know, much of the diversity anyway probably is in asexual life forms. Where the species concept. You know, Whereas the clustering is an inevitable result of reproductive isolation, then you cannot ignore that, right? I know, but I mean I, I, what I'm saying is that the clustering might also be the consequence of just the law clustering asexual species as well. Right, we think. I mean, I talk about this in my book. And there's different reasons why asexuals and asexuals might cluster. We're not sure that asexuals cluster anyway. I don't think we have enough data to really know that now. And so. yeah, it might be much more continuous distribution. Yeah, well, yeah, there are at least large scale clusters. I think it has to be something to do with trade-offs, too. I mean, reproductive isolation is really another word for if you're good at one thing, you're bad at another thing. So when you meet together, you, you screwed it up. So that has to do with ecology as well. I guess we can move to another question. And um, this one is a lot more specific than the previous one. Uh, so what is a BDM incompatibility, and what role do they play in the situation? Sorry, what is a BDM incompatibility and what role do they play in speciation? <laughs> I think the context of that is we've been seeing Dovjansky Muller incompatibilities, the definition of which is becoming extremely broad. So and that was my interpretation of the question. What what is and what isn't? Controversy about that. So, <laughs> I mean, I thought the definition was that it's just a result of epistasis of genes that evolve in allopatrically in independence from one another. They come back together again, they don't work well. They produce some kind of, well, usually post psychotic isolation, but I guess it could be something else as well. So, so but it, it's broadened from that, or? Not? <clears throat> So one example, would you, if you had it, would be these gene duplicates that are resolved on different chromosomes, would you, call, would you call that BDM or not? That would be an example of where one of the current gray areas. So, the, so you know, you have a, a chromosome, <coughs> gene gets duplicated on another chromosome, then copy A is lost in species A, copy B is lost in species B. They come back together and some of the F2s lack the gene entirely. So you could call that a BDM, but there's no divergence in gene sequence, and it's kind of presence or absence is your BDM-like thing. Yeah, but each of the losses works well in its own genetic background. Yeah. It requires the coming together of two species in a hybrid to create that incompatibility. So I would consider that by what I know about the definition of BDM incompatibility. Yeah. I'm not sure if BDMs have to be out of time. So I, I know there's, personally, I just know maybe one example is from plants, but the plant immune system, when pathogens, the plant immune system, when they, at least part of it, when they uh, defend against pathogens, they have one thing that is altered by the pathogen molecule or the so-called effectors in the, in the host cell, and then uh, that altered target is recognized by so-called guard protein, and also in the host cell. The host cell has two things, the target of the effector and the, the guard, and the guard recognizes the altered target. So if, and what happens if that system is screwed up, so to speak, if it's not fine-tuned, is that they show uh, um, what people call uh, necro hybrid necrosis. Well, no, the hybrid necrosis comes with the incompatibility. What, what, what happens if the system is screwed up is that the guard recognizes the target even if it's not 
modified by the effect. And so the plant cell dies even if there's no pathogen. And so these two things have to evolve in concert. And then you can get this uh, incompatibility. But at one step, one step is actually detrimental, but if you make two steps, you uh, go from one viable option to another. Um, you don't have more about this. Oh, that's good explanation. <laughs> Adapts it to freshwater at the expense of very poor survival in salt water. And the hybridization of those two forms would then you know, do something silly like be badly adapted to the sea but swim out to sea. And that would then create And you should even think of sexual isolation as that because the male preference evolves in one species, co evolves with female. I mean, female preference in male trait, co evolves with one species and the other species the same way. And then you put together the male trait and the female preference from two species, they don't interact at all. I mean, I think that takes it beyond the definition of what, because I think it was meant to apply to developmental screw-ups and that cause sterility and stuff. And those you could expect to follow a snowball effect. I'm not sure that speciation based on sexual selection or ecological differences, you'd expect a snowball. snowball just because, I mean, it's not just the general screw you're talking about, but adaptation of specific traits to specific environments. But I think Dobzhansky's original definition wasn't very precise exactly how Far or to what isolate mechanism to the plasma to just refer to the complementary genes that cause physiological isolation of what entirely clear at the time of what that name. So we could make a new term for ecological it's called the sheep. reported in the literature were found to cause postzygotic isolation between species that had diverged a long time ago. Um, it was therefore impossible to know whether these were all involved in the first stages of divergence or if they were simply accumulated afterwards. So are we any closer today to finding the genes that actually played a role in the early stages of divergence between sister species? And if so, does this get us closer to understanding the initial stages of speciation? I wouldn't say absolutely. There are quite a number of genes, particularly those involved in prezygotic isolation, such as in plants. I think there are quite a number involved in shifts in uh, floral pigmentation, which result in pollinator shifts, shifts and also changes in um, floral scent, um, changes from upcrossing to self -hating. All of these were sure, we're talking about differences in them genetic differences between clone and sister taxa so that actually many of them have actually been tied down to reproductive isolation of natural populations, and I would say that there's without a doubt some of those really were involved in species. Have they actually isolated any of those? Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. So it's like, for example, um, oral pigmentation in, in those uh, snap things and metamorphosis. Okay. I just know the yup chain, which hasn't been really isolated. Yeah, no, yup chain is not one of the better ones. Um, um, but snap dragons have, this is some work by Mark Archer's group in metamorphosis. Um, and so some of these people have actually also come out of the field and looked at um, Oh, okay, push it. Yes, um, there are certain changes in the anthocyanin pathway that over and over again seem to result in, seem to be the genes that are result, resulting in, in the of culture. So those would be the closest thing to true speciation gene in the sense that it's the same genes involved on multiple occasions. And they know that these genes evolve before we break the isolation. Yeah. Okay. They know that how? Well, in some cases, you can still, you know, be, be in, in quite a number of cases, these are sister types of where most of the other variables are not complete. But in other cases, um, they're not 100% sure because it involves the splitting of the two lineages, and so it's a little earlier. In that case, you know, you know that they're coming from the lineage, but not necessarily in those. But in most cases, the sister types are both protected, so they'll not still make, for example, one case in step right, it's actually on board of its own. I think there's an unfortunate tendency amongst people who work on post-psychotic isolation to call these genes speciation genes. David Proskopes just has a paper, which is a good paper on the nature of these genetics, on summarizing all that we know about genes that cause post-psychotic isolation. And if you look at the early part of the article, he says, well, I'm not going to call these speciation genes because we don't know if they're really involved in speciation. And then at the end, towards the conclusion, they just somehow magically turn into speciation. <laughs> And I wrote him an email about that, but uh, I haven't heard a reply yet. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, there's a lot more career advantage to calling. I mean, you got to realize that part of this is that you get a lot more attention calling these genus species. I mean, Lauren and I were talking about this today. Than calling it a reproductive barrier gene. Plus, if you Google reproductive barrier gene, you get all kinds of well, things. Well, that's not a barrier to it. It's fine. It's, if you just do barrier gene, then you get a small intestine barrier to but, so uh, it's kind of barrier gene would be a nice catchy phrase, but if you want to get people to read your paper, and this, and again, Jared called this careerist, you put speciation gene in it, even though you know full well that they probably are not speciation gene, at least some of them. So, um, as I told Jerry, the reason you use it in our title is simply because you want to as well just actually read the paper. <laughs> it's a very careerist notion, but yes. You think the name Raceburg would be a sufficient reason? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Anyone else? Anyone else? <laughs> so one example from Drosophila, where a lot of the post-psychotic isolation genes have been discovered is the overdrive gene between Pseudo-Obscura and subspecies, which causes uh, sterility in as far as it's known. That they're not reproductively isolated yet, but uh, at this point... Yeah, that's the problem with these, because they're allopatric and... Let's they, know what they would be if they were. Yeah, I mean, it's likely that they probably fuse if they came back together again. So that's one of the problems with these things is if they're not yet species, then you can't say, well, it's a speciation gene. If they're already species, then you can say, well, this happened after reproductive isolation was complete. So There's also a class of um, speciation genes which are simply involved in adaptation to a contrasting environment. And some of those genes have been discovered, but their quantitative contribution to reproductive isolation is not yet known. Summary contribution for the spermal transplant. But a lot of those speciation genes might be a fairly small effect. It might be their net accumulation over any other side that may be responsible for things like immigrants and viability or the, the phenotype of hybrids not somehow matching well the environment of the trans. That brings up an interesting question. Um, is any gene that's responsible for geographic ad differential adaptation to? ecologies and across the geographic range, could you consider that a speciation gene? Because it leads to immigrant viability here. Well, so, I don't know if the, the concept is all that useful if it applies, or if it applies to genes that uh, are involved in adaptation or select against even weekly in the contrast environment. So if you've got hundreds of such genes, they might produce 25% immigrant viability, but 
we didn't think that once you start accumulating a large number of genes of small effect, the concept of speciation gene loses its interest. Yeah, I actually think that's an important point. Important theme because it Again, but if you if the question is about speciation gene, in my mind this is broader than just the productive isolation genes because I use speciation as the problem of diversification. So what you're asking is what causes diversification, and I think in in terms of ecological diversification, we have some good uh, genetic data in bacterial uh, experiments for uh, all ranges of microbes out of the Lincoln spreader spreaders where it is uh, very well understood, but I think fairly well understood with the genetic changes or that separate those two, those strains. And of course, that's a very small scale experiment and a small scale diversification, but uh, that it's only, only ecological and not reproductive. Nevertheless, in some sense, you could call those the, spe the speciation or the diversification genes because those are the ones that actually produce diversity. So I think, yeah, I think in, uh, well, in my thinking anyway, I, I would uh, view the term more broadly. But if you ask about evidence, as I said, I think there's evidence for the longer systems for that kind of association. So, Jerry, in answer to your question, there's not a lot of evidence on where outside of either of the genes that really contribute to some sort of even geographic isolation of plants. I don't know one case where there's a good example where someone has found the same gene that um, they have, that, that has a quality function there for us. There are some genes out there, single genes, that are responsible, for example, for people copper talking and copper back and so forth. The one that has been found um, simply the, it's the allele that causes tolerance is not spatially segregated very well, and so it's kind of, it's hard to make a good case for it. There are these floral color genes and might also be considered integrated viability genes because you know one species of nameless lands at a different elevation, it's not going to get pollinated. It's sort of a same thing. So, so, so floral adaptations can be kind of contribute to both aspects of one's integrated isolation, pollinator isolation as well as integrated viability. question that you, I don't know if you're going to ask this, but I would like to ask you the panel. It seems like everybody in the field, including myself now, is, has the, our goal of finding out the genes that are responsible for reproductive isolation, as if no other question is of importance in this area. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, is that really what we should be doing, or is there something else that we need to be doing as well? And are we really going to get all these answers from finding out? I mean, I was just thinking of Biscuit Bechel area where we know, and if you believe the story about the pepper moth, and we pretty much know the ecology and the selective forces and how long they took and, you know, what happened, and I'm not sure how much we're going to add to that by finding, and we still don't know it, the gene that's responsible for the dark color of the moth, you know. That's not like the Holy Grail is suddenly going to make the story comprehensible when we find it. I'm just wondering if, you know, are we being misguided in this search for speciation gene? I have no answer to that. I just, yeah. Well, I think, you know, that there are two kinds of speciation genes. There's are those involving pregnant sterility and viability. And I actually think after another 10 to 20 of those, people are going to sort of get bored with the topic. And the reason is, is there are so many different ways things can malfunction. Do we really care? Um, and I think it was interesting at first. And I think, though, that particularly as we get more and more of these cases where they're just due to the divergent resolution of duplicate genes, it's going to, I mean, we could go and se sequence, like in Arabidopsis, you can sequence two different uh, gene ecotypes. You can find out where you do this with different species. You can find out which genes have been pseudogenized in the two different lines. You can make an F2 and actually predict exactly where you and look for you know, genes that are required for a function and you would be able to identify hundreds of isolation genes probably at any given cross between two plant species. That's, that's what would be interesting right now, but in a few years it's not going to be interesting at all. I think though that um, this doesn't mean that this is not the first few were a lot of fun, and I think this will still continue for a little while. I do think we can learn a lot about things from, for example, genes involved in um, ecogeographic isolation. We claim for, box claim for a long, long time that Geographic isolation is 
most important type of isolation. In fact, the most important thing that we have in plants. Though we know nothing about the genetics under our attack. I think knowing what there's so far, as I mentioned, there's one gene that was cloned that was thought to be involved, and yet it turns out the tolerance allele is found everywhere. You know, so what's going on? And I think we will learn some things from that. But I agree with Jeremy in the sense that in many cases, we're not going to be learning so much more about speciation. We're learning about the natural history of genes and alleles. So I think there are some conditions where the genetics of adaptation can really propel you forward. Even if your overall question is to understand mechanisms and not genetics at all. And uh, one would be, um, you know, Felsenstein had a, a pretty comprehensible explanation or comprehensive explanation for why gene, appreciation of gene flow is difficult. We also proposed some solutions, and uh, there are genetic solutions. And uh, I think it's worthwhile to look for the genes in order to test those general ideas about how appreciation might possibly occur with gene flow. Um, another example would be um, that uh, there are proposed mechanisms for how new species might form based on intergenomic conflict. And as far as I know, the sole evidence that intergenomic conflict is involved in speciation comes not from the study of intergenomic conflict and its consequences, but actually from the discovery of genes that affect both sterility and probably resulted from meiotic drive. So actually, some mechanisms have come forward. So in many cases, the genes are the only evidence that we have so far for particular mechanisms. I'm just wondering, though, I mean, a lot of these things rest on, like David's work, where he finds these, like Nauka and other genes that are responsible for post psychotic isolation, and then they find the so called signature of selection of these genes. And mm -hmm. to them, that's the end of the story, it's selection. They're just, what about the hard ecological work of determining what kind of selection? Yeah, I agree. And I think to some extent, saying that we don't need to know the genetics, we just need to know that there are genes, is equivalent to saying all we need to know is that there is selection. There's a signature of selection in the genome, and we can understand all of evolution from that. There's something unsatisfying about some of these traits as well that we study, you know, the ecology of, like we think of body size is somehow important in the evolution of reproductive isolation. We need to think about populations, but it's a somewhat difficult body size, it's a pretty complicated trait. And I, don't know, I, I get the sense that it might be made up of some other blocks that may be um, actually more important somehow than just measurement of standard length. We have no idea whether understanding genetics will help us that way, but we're going to try. All right, so we've got one, one longer question that came from a, a constellation of people, including Alistair, Kieran, and Gina, <clears throat> and, and Jerry touched on it today. Um, so scenarios of speciation have traditionally been discussed in terms of geography, so allopatry or sympatry. Um, but in light of the recent empirical theoretical findings regarding speciation with gene flow, do you think it's still a useful framework for understanding the process of speciation? And um, if one is to use a population genetic framework um, where migration rate varies between 0 and 0.5, is there anything conceptually gained by using the discrete categories such as allopatry and sympatry um, aside from just promoting more arguments? Yeah, well, I, in my book, I classified them as geographically. Um, I think I lumped Parapatrick and um, Allopatrick together and Sympatrick separately because it's controversial. But since the Fitzpatrick and Gabrielis papers have come out, I've realized that the geographic definition makes it doesn't make a lot of sense, I don't think. Um, pardon? Only since then? I'm not as hard as you are. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I realized that a lot of cases that I, you know, there, I mean, there's, it's, if you're interested in speciation, you really should read these papers by Mallet and his colleagues on one hand and Fitzpatrick on the other um, to see the difference in views. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, it's just, I didn't realize that what I was calling St. Patrick's speciation in my book, based on a geographic definition, was population genetically quite a different thing from normal St. Patrick's speciation. An well, example is the Bejewic finches, where these are host parasites, nest parasites that switch hosts sympatrically. So if you a bird lays an egg, one of these parasites in a nest of a different host, it's instantly a new species because the the females will imprint on that nest to go and lay their own eggs in, and the males will imprint on the song of the host. So from then on, they're reproductively isolated. 
Now, geographically, that's sympatric speciation because it occurs just between one tree and another. But you don't have this tension between recombination and selection, which is the real thing that I guess Felsenstein poses the question of sympatric speciation. And so many questions, that, so many things that we consider sympatric speciation, like polyploidy, like the finches, like the palm trees on the Lord Howe, like electronic speciation, don't really fit the population genetic definition of sympatric speciation because there's tricks that occur, like in polyploidy, to prevent gene flow from the very outset. So you might want to say that there's sympatric speciation, like Mallet does, I think, to, say, to make himself look better by increasing the number of cases, but they're a very different kettle of fish than the other thing. And I think Fitzpatrick is right that the whole <coughs> controversy about sympatric speciation has been over whether selection can overcome the homogenizing effects of gene flow. And that's an explicitly population genetic problem. It's not a biogeographic problem. So, so I would be tempted now if I were to rewrite my book to have a chapter on speciation with gene flow and a chapter with speciation without gene flow. I think there's a, a big difference there. Dolph made the point in the science paper that if you have mutation order effects, then a little bit of gene flow makes a huge difference in homogenizing things versus no gene flow. So there may be a threshold there that's a really biologically important one. But I think probably it's time to discard those terms, just be, unless you're explicit from the very outset about what you mean. But I think like, from a natural historian, I agree with you entirely in terms of it's really good to know whether there is a tension between the gene flow selection and uh, uh, gene flow recombination. But I also think that one of the most fascinating things about speciation is the natural history of the tricks that, they, so to speak, allow uh, taxa to speciate. All those tricks we've learned over the past decade or two, because people have been thinking about sympathetic speciation, we've learned all sorts of ways that it's possible to avoid the tension between gene uh, 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 flow and recombination, selection recombination. And so um, I would hate to just sort of throw all of that information, you know, to abandon the research program of learning about those tricks. Even though I agree with you in terms of the the discussion of it should be in terms of the population genetics. And that would get rid of the controversy, so to speak, and be looking for tricks. Um, and we do see a path of war looking for examples where the population, the problem of the population is somehow negative. I think it's important to keep <clears throat> the terms allopatric and sympatric speciation as sort of extreme models. And uh, I, th I think a lot of speciation happens in sort of a spatial context, like parapatric speciation or allopatric with, with um, periods of hybridization and hybrid cell formation happening. So I think if I understood the gist of the question, can you take um, spatial context out of these models and just use um, sort of a migration rate um, between island populations? Um, I think that would be missing a lot of reality. Take. Another problem with those models, though, is that we're, I think we're starting to realize that a lot of speciation involves transitions from an allopatry to parapatry to sympatry, and mm -hmm. the ranges are never, that they're always changing, and there's no one label you can put on a lot of kinds of speciation at all. Yeah, and most of these birds that we're studying, uh, they take about a million to three million years to evolve full species status, but um, during that time, they've been about 15 or 20 glacial cycles. So there's likely been periods of allopatry and then hybridization, and then allopatry hybridization, allopatry hybridization. And each time, the, 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 you know, the narrowness of the hybrid zone getting a little more narrow, a little more reproductive isolation. So I think to understand that fully, you need a full model that takes into account this, the spatial structure during the hybridization phase. <laughs> yeah, so okay, here's my two sets. I think that the uh, you know the classification based on geography is actually not uh, very useful. For example, you mentioned you long uh, parapath to get to allopatric, but that clearly depends very much on the exact process that's going on. Whether that should, whether, you know, 
we have parapathic initiation, is it what's happening in the middle? Some ecological interactions in the middle that drives the two things apart, but that is not our imagination. It's they would say, well, that's more like, you know, what's happening, what's important is happening in Zimbabwe, or is it what's happening at the margins that's important, then, and then it might be our factor. So I think one should have, one should classify diversification processes based on the process that is occurring. So whether it is due to interactions or is it due to geographical isolation. Um, it doesn't like process, does it? But yeah. it's just by geography. When you said process, I thought you meant like like sexual selection versus drift versus natural selection. Well, cycle. yeah. Is it, is it, <coughs> well, is it adaptation in isolation or is it adaptation to, you know, ecological mm -hmm. interaction? Interaction. And whether that happens, you know, over the range, of course, there is no sympathetic population, technically speaking. But sympathetic, in, in terms of the modeling, in the modeling sense, means well mixed, and nothing is well mixed unless we have some, you know, not even, probably not even our bacteria and our wilds are completely well mixed. So nothing is sympathetic in that sense. But on the other hand, there is a lot of contact, even if you have a broad range. So and then the question becomes, okay, what is it that is that drives to you know, these subpopulations that drives these subpopulations so to diversify? And I think that's where the classification should be not in the geographical context. I, I happen to think that the, I mean this concentration of geographical context is a, is a historic contingency of the field I think. Because allopatry was more or less the easiest, most straightforward scenario to understand how the situation occurs. And okay, so this was one thing I could describe, and then they took it from there, more or less. I don't really know if that's correct. That's my impression. Yeah, I also want to add that um, the, the degree of geographical separation is also partly involved characteristic. One of my most amazing things that I saw happen in the Galapagos was in the dry season, a flock of birds land from another island that don't actually occur there or breed there. And you know, before the breeding season begins, they fly back. So a lot of uh, a lot of allopatry, even on the, in the Galapagos archipelago, is, is sort of occurs by choice as much as true and physical isolation. And I also think in these populations that begin to diverge in separate areas or in separate habitats, the sympatry is constantly tested. You know, this was already an idea raised. And, you know, individuals are either blowing and landing on the other, and until you know, eventually the time is reached where they're able to coexist at least to, to some extent, or, or in closer spatial proximity, and it sort of uh, uh, develops throughout this process. So it's not so. Well, time geography is really a cartoon. Uh, the events that take place during a speciation event, even when involving spatial structure. Still want to know why that different differential different amounts of genes well, you don't take spatial structure and spatial Absolutely. structure is one of the reasons for that. So it's part of the rich natural natural history of speciation. Even if we don't use it as a way of I agree with everyone on the panel that it's not the best way to um, to classify the world speciation, but it's still a real key feature of natural history of speciation. So kind of a, a, a follow-up from that. Um, <coughs> Which is, a, a, I guess, aside from the, the special case of reinforcement, do you think that speciation is adaptive, and whether that is a frequent mode of speciation? Could you rephrase that question? By <laughs> 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 adaptive, you mean that nature is that there are selective forces that are actually operating to force things to become different from one another. I, mean, I like it reinforcement. Right. So aside. From that, So you're saying is reinforcement ubiquitous part of the speciation process, uh, just frequently or is it rarely? Is that the question? Yes, Mike. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Give me your example. So, so <coughs> what you're making that sense? Say? Since I'm not sure. Where do you get the uh, term adaptive speciation? Is that because? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that I should answer that question because I think we coined that term. <laughs> 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 I 
<coughs> but I'm not sure about that, but, but if that happens. I mean, so, so the way we use that term in that book, in the 2004 book, is exactly as it is. the way you describe it, adaptive speciation occurs when the splitting is an adaptive response to interaction. And so the question, I see your question as asking whether that's a common process, and I, you know, I um, cover your ass answer is that, that that's an empirical question, of course, but in the end. <laughs> 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 just go out and uh, see whether that's happening. My impression has, you know, has been since not too long ago. I, I started thinking about these things that the uh, the possibility of this occurring has been underestimated, and, and there's a bias. My impression was always that there's a bias in the field in terms of. What, you, what people are looking for and which systems they study. So my my guess would be that adaptive speciation, once people really start looking for it, is not that uncommon. And I'd like to mention that um, Evo Evo, I don't know if some of you were there, Travis uh, introduced the uh, an interesting example of a of a case where you know the, the rock which so, which is, uh, and goes a little bit back to what uh, Lawrence said and uh, Theron said about spatial dimension being important. So this is a, a great diversification along the gradient. And I think traditionally people would not, you know, would say, well, that's diversification by isolation. But, so I was talking, I guess it's not, it's not really known, but from what I was, the way I understood what Travis was saying is that this is actually adaptive speciation in my terminology because it is driven by competition. In other words, it's driven at the interface of the two emerging species. And so I mean, I'm just saying this because this kind of diversification along environmental gradients, my impression is that this is fairly common. And in each case, one could then go and actually yeah, that's not necessarily adaptive speciation. Yeah. I mean, you can have that kind of sundering along the gradient without having the selective forces be <coughs> to avoid harmonization with the other species. The question, if, if, the question is what drives them into lumps. Yeah. Because if you, if you don't have a diverse back force, what you would expect along the gradient as a normal, it would be just some, some gradient, some climb in the some gradient in, in the field. So one species will the gradient and maybe, you know, with the, before from the environmental gradient by gene flow and adaptation to the marshes. But the question is why why did it become, you know, from from in phenotype space from having this shape to having this shape. But, and I think, well, I mean I'm not sure how far one is improving, but I can imagine that the reason why it becomes prompt is because of what happens in the I don't I don't think so. It's because of the genealogy. It's the individual share family history and that, that leads to company. The reason I say this is because I have models on the computer modeling that it's a, a situation where you have an environmental climb and, uh, and then you um, see what traits the, the individuals take. And after time, you get company without any. I don't think it's because of the competition yeah. between, between them. It's because it's because of the coalescent process. I think that might depend <coughs> quite a bit on the type of model. Because mm -hmm. I also have models. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a model. <laughs> 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 I mean, suppose you have a model of, of like parapetric species, and species are simply responding to adjacent habitats. One is dry and one is wet and there's strong selection and diverges them. And then maybe there's a little bit of selection right. against migration. So, so how do you, do you call it adaptive species? No, then in that case, yeah. so I'm just saying that, you know, maybe just like in the models, there are different types, kinds of speciation along these gradients. But what I'm saying is that in that particular example, and in other examples that I've heard, what do you call them? But anyway, that there's at least scope for adaptive species, but it's actually competition or whatever you call it, that are actually in the middle of the gradient that rises. I'm not saying that's always the case. 
Well, it, it keeps, I mean, it completes the process, but it's not, I'm not sure that that's considered, that's what's driven them apart in the first well, place. Well, but then, I don't know, yeah, maybe that's a chicken and egg or whatever, but uh, I guess it's the same with reinforcement. Reinforcement is a form of adaptive speciation in that sense, but it can only occur if there are certain prerequisites that don't involve interaction with those species, but just general evolutionary divergence. Yes. But so then you have to have the species first. So well, you have to have a lot of pre-corrective isolation first. But I'd like to return to a point that someone made, which is that it's an empirical question. Um, I think we have a number of positive examples from that. I don't think it's possible. Fraction of speciation that involves that process, that involves that process. but something that you might want to tell you. Yeah. On this point, we've had a lot of seminars this term about the new theory of, ec of ecological distributions where you could argue that that's empirical data saying there, that amongst <coughs> guilds of um, species from within an area, they're interchangeable, which suggests that, that there isn't a lot of data, empirical data, that they are diverging, that the closely related species are very, very different in their ecological um, uses. So that. I guess that's a question for the panel. Do you think that data on the fit of the neutral theory sheds light on this very question? So I think the only thing that it is is almost always a set of So okay. it's almost the, the Hubble's neutral theory is about always that. plants. Always plants. Uh, things that can't choose their environment is sort of thrown over to the and tropics or and tropical. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, yeah. <laughs> 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 you have the you know, same thing there. So what, I'm not quite sure what data that is. So, so, yeah, so I, okay, I have to go one more time back to Travis's data. That's, yeah. There's exactly the opposite. Yeah, no, and, and, and so the question is, how often do you see these the ecological interchangeability versus not ecological interchangeability? And that's exactly what the community ecologists are asking. And we don't have a lot of cases where they're trying to measure what um, Nathan's trying to do now, what fraction of time is yeah. it? But it, I've been sh I've been surprised at how ecologically interchangeable a lot of those plant species have been. And I think it's important to remind um, sort of observers of this is even if you have ecological differentiation, it too might have evolved after speciation was yeah. active. Awesome. So One comment on on the, these neutral models of species solutions. Often these are species from a bunch of different divergent groups rather than sister types. And in my experience, sister species often aren't ecologically divergent, even, even if the same um, sets of sort of uh, ecological preferences of a different group, the uh, closely related species of the same group often show different ecological preferences. Um, so it might be the reproductive isolation that actually allows or different groups of organisms to occupy the same uh, uh, habitats is because they're reproductively isolated. Right, shouldn't, right? I mean, if you're reproductively isolated, you should still go extinct if you're reproductively identical. Well, actually, that's not the case. It should take forever, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I think within the, 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 the time frame that, that we work with, it's probably not going to happen. I used to think that as well until people started doing better ecological models. And then I realized what I was saying in my seminar about the fact that um, I was always talking about hybrids and their parents, that if they were ecologically, they weren't ecologically divergent, but one of them would extinct. Well, <coughs> someone, an ecologist told me, well, it would take a long, long time. So I stopped that. <laughs> <laughs> Is anyone done that? Trying to fit systems together that So I was under the impression that there are phylogenetic group lineages that show these patterns that I've never seen in quantified. So, so doesn't Colin, Colin Kelly have a paper reviews, but the 
Since speciation research has undergone dramatic changes in the last 30 years, in terms of the process of speciation, what have you changed your opinion about the most since the start of your career? <laughs> what have you changed your opinion about the most since the start of your career in terms of speciation? Are we all supposed to answer that? Or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know Francis Meyer was here, he would say, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I was right all along. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I've changed my, I mean, when I started out, I was a pretty diehard allopatric speciation guy under the influence of Meyer and Dipshansky. Um, I suppose I've changed my opinion on you know that speciation is indeed possible with gene flow, which is a big admission for me. <laughs> Maybe even possible when there's free. We're catching this on film. Yeah, I mean it's just because the models show that you can get appreciable divergence in the face of gene flow, and you can even get sympathetic divergence, which you know get under reasonable models. So, although I'm not willing to go so far as to say that sympathetic speciation is common. I will say that there's demonstrated cases of it, and that there's probably it's probably likely that many cases of speciation in nature involve gene flow during the process or sometime during the process, um, and therefore it would be at least parapatric under the classical definition. You know, I wouldn't have thought that when I was starting out. So. For me, the biggest change was in my day, everyone. First of all, and I'm not sure I ever thought this, but. Uh, yeah, well, I guess the biggest thing going on really was is that everyone thought in, in the botanical community that speciation occurred in small populations. The small populations were the, the uh, sort of where change, the, the important changes in speciation. Part of this was drift, but also partly the idea that these small populations were the periphery of species ranges or a new, uh, um, a, a new habitat where they were exposed to stronger selection. And Jerry and others disabused me of this notion over the years. And so, and I think the evidence is overwhelming now that, um, uh, that in many ways, sort of like on the island, the small population is sort of a by, is, it's, it's incidental rather than the you know, key feature. But I think more and more we realize that indeed uh, the larger population is a selection is more efficient. So I think that's a transition that's taking place in, in the, the entire field. I don't think Jerry is like that I broke to begin with, but that is certainly a uh, small population. So I um, didn't work on speed. My background is more ecological, and I didn't really think about speciation until after my postdoc. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have uh, many deeply felt views to change. I didn't know very much about speciation. I'd heard about all of these ideas regarding fender vents and uh, the role of drift. And I think if I had any vague notion about the causes of speciation, that somehow randomness was involved. And so um, actually, what I developed most or changed the most from, from not having thought about it a lot to what I think today would be the role of selection and speciation. And the idea that I actually, unlike drift, selection is a, is a process that uh, leaves a signature and so can be tested as a mechanism. And uh, what I've been most surprised by is in how many times signatures of selection have been found on genes that cause postzygotic isolation. <coughs> Or how often uh, people have found virgin selection and traits that are involved in um, mating compatibility. Um, yeah. You managed to answer that question without saying you ever changed your mind about anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't really have a mind to change. I was kind of a, I was I was kind of neutral about the whole process. But, uh, what, what originally I, I mean there are probably many lines, but I remember just overhearing. Um, Mike Lynch in the hallway and say something like, well, what's ecology got to do with speciation? And I, I just started to think, well, yeah, what does it have to do with uh, speciation? What did we used to think? What do we, what do we know now? My, my impression is that in 1985, you, you would ask any botanist or zoologist what caused speciation. That's 
Well, the, the pattern with, with me is the same as you talk. I went from nothing to something. So, I mean, so my opinion was blank, and now I think um, that ecological interactions are probably important. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to be a little provocative here. <laughs> Just say uh, what I've changed my mind about the most is the biological species concept. And um, so, you know, when I started out, I, I was a total adherent to the biological species concept, and I still kind of am, so I'm sort of playing devil's advocate here. But as I've looked at more and more um, situations with birds, Kind of, you know, previous allopatric groups of birds coming together, um, or, or different situations where we're just trying to sort out how many species are there, what processes led to the patterns we see. Um, we, we face the awkward situation sometimes of finding um, two things that are listed as two species in the bird book, uh, because they look so different. Then when we go and find where they come together, there's extensive hybridization with every intermediate you can imagine in over a pretty broad area, like 100 kilometers. And so we find lots and lots of hybridization between things that are clearly otherwise um, very phenotypically distinct and genetically distinct. So this led me to start thinking, well, you know, what's going on here? We have this biological species concept. If we were back in the 60s, people would have immediately lumped those, those two species into one because there's lots of hybridization. Now we're finding with genetic studies that when you find a hybridome like that, it doesn't mean there's lots of gene exchange. It just means that there's lots of reproduction, there's lots of, there's lots of hybrids, but actually most of the genome is not uh, being blended between them. So I've kind of revised my working definition of what a species is into something that's uh, more of phenotypic and genotypic clusters that persist in sympatry. And I'd actually argue that most biologists, even those adhering to the biological species concept, sort of use that definition in practice. If, if let's say I had two birds and I looked um, between them and I tried to hybridize them in the lab and I found, oh, they produce perfectly good offspring. I look in the wild, oh, they produce perfectly good offspring. I can't imagine a point at which I'd say, oh, they're two species if they're genetically distinct out there, and the evidence is that they've been genetically distinct for a million years. So that tells me I'm not really using a biological species concept in defining my species. It's more that I know that some kind of uh, selection against hybrids um, is maintaining the situation. That's reproductive isolation. And, and so that is reproductive isolation, but try to explain that to a lay person. When I, when I go and give public talks up in Northeast BC, and I explain to them, uh, these things are reproductively isolated, but you just showed us a hybrid. And you just said there's lots of hybrids around. Um, so the term reproductive isolation is a strange one because it, it still allows lots of reproduction. Um, it allows lots of back crossing. Uh, what's really going on in, in these cases is um, is that hybrids are, they suffer a, a slight uh, fitness uh, disadvantage in, in the hybrids. And so to me, the, the right term for that, like if I could go back and rewrite all the terminology, I just call that uh, selection against hybrids. You know, but it's sort of, uh, it's been, the terminology, we, we lump all these things under uh, the term reproductive isolation. So, that's, that's kind of how I've changed a lot. And, you know, I still know that there are these clusters because of something called reproductive isolation, but that could be selection against hybrids, it can be disordered mating, it can be a lot of different things. But the, the terminology has led me anyway to be sort of confused about it, and, and it, it's hard to explain to lay people why you're using the term reproductive isolation sometimes. It doesn't even have to occur with the genome. You can have yeah, like exactly. in, your, in, your, in, your, in your talking, and the mitochondria seems to have flowed perfectly freely across the bay. That doesn't mean so clearly there's 
not competing for that vaccination. But I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody in this room would, yeah. even if you're here at the Biological Species Concert, would say that reproductive isolation has to be absolutely 100% completed since that should be qualified as species. So I don't think that. I think, you know, there's a gradation to be more or less species like, and, you know, and these things are almost species like. But if you really think of it, that we need to use our terminology, our professional terminology, to adjust that to avoid misleading lay people. I'm, I'm not advocating adjusting it now, but I'm saying in retrospect, um, I think it's too, too fixed now. But I'm saying in retrospect, I wonder if it might have been better if Ernst Meyer and Dobronsky had used the terms, had not, you know, we, we use the term reproductive isolation on things like, uh, you know, if the hybrids just migrate to the wrong place. That, that to me is, there, there's, first, is not isolation. And second, it's very little to do direct with, directly with reproduction. It results in, a, in less gene exchange between the species. So the species are genetically isolated. But I, so I, I think it's just a poor descriptor, but I think it's so entrenched now that we're, we're, we're going to keep using it. I, I don't know what the sense. I mean, you can't, I mean, if you see a phenotypic and genotypic cluster in nature, regardless of how much potential for gene flow there's going to be, a lot of people will be very tempted to call those species mm -hmm. um, if there is if there is a strong phenotypic. Well, well that's what I realized, just cluster. being in the bird literature and, and Salamander literature and other things. I mean, David Wake with the NCTRN species, same, same debate. I mean, um, you know, real, really what we biologists describe as taxa, we most of the time are looking at phenotypes and genotypes. Very, very rarely are we ever testing reproductive isolation. Yeah, but I mean, the phenotypes and genotypes are a proxy for reproductive isolation. If you see two groups in one area that are absolutely fixed for two different for two alleles and two loci. Oh, I mean, no. I agree. I completely agree. But, but they, they don't have much. Yeah. It, 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 so if you, if, you, if you could make arguments that they're epoxy or that they're direct isolation, but, but in reality, it's just that they're unlikely to exist without very much, um, without without extensive reproductive isolation. But, um, but if the amount of reproductive isolation um, in terms of gene flow uh, or potential for gene flow doesn't matter, then why why even why why not just just start just make the whole definition about the phenotypic and genotypic clusters? Well, then you're in the situation of I mean, classifying brown-eyed and blue-eyed people as different species. Right? Well, no, it's only single cluster. Yeah. Your definition of cluster means more than one gene. Is that correct? I mean, genetically uh, based barriers, which is sort of particularly intrinsic barriers, because it means that the some of these differences have been fixed in concrete and allow the images to go on their own separate direction. It's not so much that they're necessarily a great way to find species, but certainly once you have some reproductive isolation, they can give you, they, they sort of help to uh, um, uh, stabilize this set of genotypic clusters. Um, yeah, but even if you Instead of just matter if you want to define the terms by the signal or the mechanism, I mean, you're just talking about what created the species versus the signal of the species, or how you, how you tell the species apart. And what's more important to us in figuring out what to call the terms? The mechanism or the, or the signal? I think it's the mechanism. I mean, to me I it is. I, mean, if, I think we're conflating the, how we recognize species versus how we define species. Yeah. We recognize identical twins because they're two individuals that look almost alike. We don't define identical twins as two people that look really similar. We define them as two individuals so they're probably with a single fertilized egg that's split. Now, which definition enables you to make more heuristic progress to understand this phenomenon? It's the, and for the same reason, I think defining species through reproductive isolation, that is the ultimate reason why we have these clusters. I agree. And I, I just want to make clear I'm not. I think any definition of species is going to have problems, so I'm not pushing this alternative thing I said about the clusters. I think every uh, every definition has problems, and they should have problems, because evolution happens. I mean, one species evolves into two, and you have gray areas. And, and so I think a lot of the, the 
literature on the debate about species concepts has been kind of like there's been this search for one concept. And we're never going to find one particular perfect concept. And that's as it should be. And so I'm not pushing this other concept. I'm just I'm just saying that the the DSC itself, that I agree it's extremely useful in terms of promoting research, and a lot of my own research is completely organized according to the BSC and according, you know, inspiration from our book and everything. But um, but it, it struck me just to keep myself internally consistent. You know, when I, when I found evidence of lack of lack of recognition of song between groups, I've decided, oh, they must be two species because they're reproductively isolated. But then when I found evidence of well, these two things everyone calls species, completely no pre-mating isolation, um, totally, total, lots of hybrid individuals. Have I then concluded that, oh, they're the same species? Uh, no, I haven't. I resisted that. Why is that? Well, it's because they're maintaining their phenotypic and genotypic identity in spite of hybridization. So back in the 60s, people would have immediately lumped them and they did that a lot. The yellow rock warblers were lumped, according to the BSC. And now um, we're, we're separating them again based on this new concept of the, the BSC. Just to be clear, you're talking it's not just F1 hybrids. You're saying whole swarms of yeah, whole swarms of hybrids. Of and you're hybrids. Still not and hybrids are only you know the 82% as fit as the pure forms. Mm -hmm. So they're not even that bad. I mean, evolutionarily, <laughs> that creates a fairly narrow hybrid zone. <laughs> But by narrow, I mean 120 kilometers wide. So it's stable. The one species is not, they're, they're both stable entities. They'll be here in a million years if we don't kill them. Uh, <coughs> so they are species. They're stable evolutionary entities. But would I say they're reproductively isolated? Well, I'd say they're selection against hybrids. And if we call that reproductive isolation, then than they are. So uh, I think we've kind of gone over time. I don't know if we'll come to a conclusion of the species concept debate today. <laughs> um, maybe we'll give us another four years. But please join me in thanking. Uh,